Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at muscle contraction for your A level biology. Now there are lots of mechanisms involved here, there are lots of processes involved here that you need to take careful note of. So get those pens ready, get that paper ready, get that cup of tea on the side and let's get started. Hi everyone. Okay, so we're going to look at muscle contraction now. So actually, how does the muscle contract? How does it get smaller? So they contract due to the shortening of each sarcomere through the sliding filament model or the sliding filament theory. So the myosin and the actin filaments, remember, so the myosin is the thicker kind of purple ones on these diagrams and the actin is the thinner yellow ones. They slide over one another to make each sarcomere contract. So at the top, we have our labelled relaxed sarcomere. So that's the kind of diagram we had in the previous video where we looked at the structure of muscles. So we need to think about what it would look like when it was contracted. So the sarcomere at the bottom is the contracted sarcomere. And we need to be able to spot the differences between them in order to be able to explain how we know that that sarcomere has contracted. So the first thing and the easiest thing really to note is that the eye bands will have got smaller narrower, shorter, however you want to say. And so that means obviously our kind of light bands, the bands of lighter tissue have got smaller, narrower because those actin filaments have been pulled along, they've been pulled over the myosin filaments. So they've moved inwards, they've been pulled over. The other thing to know obviously is the H zone has also got shorter. Um, so because the H zone is kind of the gap between the actin filaments where you can only see the myosin. And obviously, as they get pulled closer, the actin filaments get closer together. So that means the H zone gets smaller. The next thing to note that is a sort of something to talk about is that the A band doesn't change. So the A band is one of the things that does not change. It stays the same length or the same width. And that's because the A band is just the actin and myosin together. So it's where the actin and the myosin cross over and the myosin is not moving. It doesn't change shape, it doesn't shorten or lengthen, it doesn't go anywhere, it is fixed and it pulls the actin across it. So that means that if we're thinking about the dark band just being anywhere where there's actin and myosin together, that's not actually changed length. It's just that the I bands, the areas where there's just actin on the ends, have got shorter as the actin has moved over the myosin. Mainly just making sure that you can say the A band doesn't change, it stays the same because the myosin does not move. The Z discs have got closer together. So the whole sarcomere has shortened, which has pulled those two Z discs closer together than they were before. So that's another thing you can say. So we know this sarcomere is contracted because the I bands are shorter, the H zone is shorter, the Z discs are closer together, or the distance between the Z discs is shorter, and overall the sarcomere has therefore become contracted and shorter. But the A band does not change. And most of the time they'll just ask you to maybe identify these structures in a contracted sarcomere, or they could ask you to explain why the A band does not change, or it could ask you to explain how you know this image is of a contracted sarcomere. This obviously is an example of one sarcomere. We have a myofibril which will have many sarcomeres along its length and there will be many myofibrils together in the muscle, just in the muscle fiber, remember, and there's many muscle fibers as well. So if each of these sections in my myofibril is one sarcomere, they are all contracting they are all getting shorter and they will do this simultaneously so at the same time they are all going to get shorter so overall my whole myofibril becomes shorter and if all of the myofibrils in the muscle fibers in all of the muscle fibers do this then the whole muscle will get shorter and contract and then when the sarcomeres relax and return to their normal length then the muscle relaxes and gets longer again OK, so this is what's happening in terms of describing how the muscle, how the fibres move. But we actually have to go into a bit more detail to explain how the actinomycin actually interact to create 
this sliding filament model. Okay, so to do this before we kind of go in depth about how this happens, we actually have to look at the two proteins that make up the two types of filament and look at their structure. So the actin or the thin filament is made up of two chains of actin, which is a protein, twisted around each other. Another protein called tropomyosin forms a long chain, which then also twists around or coils around the actin filaments and it helps the filaments to move past each other. So on my actin here, kind of my yellow string of almost like a string of beads, and then the troponin is like a wire or a piece of rope or something that coils and twists with them. The actin has binding sites on it for the myosin heads, which we'll look at in a second. But when the muscle is relaxed, that tropomyosin, that twisted coiled tropomyosin, is actually blocking those binding sites. So in order for us to be able to do the muscle contraction, we need to move or move away that tropomyosin and free those binding sites so that the myosin can bind to the actin in order for the next stage to happen. So this is important because we need to make it clear how to link this idea of the structure to the process of how the nervous control then create the conditions that allow us to do the contraction. You'll see what I mean in a second. The myosin is the thick filament, so it's the thicker filament, and it's because it's made up of a bundle of myosin molecules, and each of those have two globular heads on them which are hinged so that they can move backwards and forwards using energy that's released from ATP. So we know that most movement is requiring energy in the body and this is no exception. So to move and bend those heads up and down, we have to use some energy from ATP. Each head has a binding site for actin and a binding site for ATP. So that means this head can bind to actin like we said on those actin myosin binding sites. And also because it needs ATP in order for you to do this movement, it has a binding site for ATP as well. So that's the actin and the myosin. That's what they look like. That's their structure. And then this hopefully will help the next part make a bit more sense. So we have to remember, again, from a previous video where we talked about the neuromuscular junction, for a muscle contraction to even occur, we have to have an action potential coming down a motor neuron to depolarize the sarcolemma and then a wave of depolarization to travel down the T-tubules and then from the T-tubules into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it's got to come down, it's got to come along here, down the T-tubules, down here. So it's a wave of depolarization and it's going to cause depolarization to happen along the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that is going, that depolarization of the sarcoplasm around it and also the sarcoplasmic reticulum itself is going to release the calcium ions. And the calcium ions are stored there in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and they are going to be released and they will diffuse down into myofibril. And this is important because it helps you trigger the muscle contraction. We said this before. So, why do we need the calcium ions to trigger the muscle contraction? Well, the calcium ions are needed to move the tropomyosin and expose the binding sites on the actin so that the myosin hairs can bind. And without the calcium ions, then we wouldn't have muscle contraction because the filaments couldn't slide past each other because those binding sites wouldn't be exposed. So this is something that could be asked in a question. So if calcium is stopped for some reason, if the something happens or there isn't enough of a signal to cause that action potential to cause that depolarization to release the calcium ions, then we do not get a muscle contraction. Okay, so this is the actual muscle contraction process. And you might see it look very similar in diagrams in textbooks, or you might see it as a diagram in a question. And we just need to be able to talk through what's happening in these stages, and then maybe be able to say what might happen if one of these stages was stopped or couldn't progress. So the first things to think about is that the calcium ions are going to diffuse into the myofibril from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, as we just said, and they will have been triggered by that depolarization of the sarcolemma and the T-tubules and cause that release. Then the calcium ions are going to bind and cause the tropomyosin to move, exposing the binding sites on the actin. So they're going to bind there, they're going to move cause a sort of a shape change which is going to expose those binding sites. That allows the myosin heads on the myosin 
filaments above and below are going to be able to attach to those binding sites and form what we call an actin myosin cross bridge. Sometimes you can just refer to it as a cross bridge. Energy that's been stored in the head, and we'll say how that's happened in a second. So you could always start by saying there is energy stored in the head if you want to. But that energy that's stored in the head, you'll see we've got ADP and PI there, is used to bend the head. Okay, like we said, it has that ability to move on that hinge shape and it pulls the actin filament along and that ADP and PI are then released. This movement is known as the power stroke and it pulls the actin filament along the top of the myosin. A new ATP molecule comes because we've released our ADP and PI that we've clearly are left over from um, ATP hydrolysis from before. So now a new ATP molecule is going to attach to the myosin head and that causes it to detach from the actin binding site. So the joining or the binding of ATP to the myosin head causes the head to detach from the actin. So the cross bridge is broken. The hydrolysis of that ATP to ADP and PI by ATPase enzyme, or however you refer to this enzyme in your spec, but ATPase enzyme is, is normally good enough, provides the energy needed to recock the myosin head. That means to kind of push it back down, ready to go again. So it needs to go back down, it needs to, it's already detached, but it needs to lay back down and it stored the energy then, like a spring being pulled back. Okay, it's ready to come back up and move back up and bind to the binding site. So it's gone back to its original position and it's got that stored energy in the form of ADP and PI kind of stored there, ready to go again. And then the process begins again. So the calcium binds, we remove the block of the binding site, then the head has enough energy to move and bind. And then we use the rest of that energy in the power stroke to pull the active filament along. We release our ADP and PI, then we get a new ATP molecule be bound, which allows just detachment from the binding site. And then we hydrolyze that ATP to release energy in order to push it back down and sort of recock it, re get ready to restart the process again. And this can go round and round and round in cycles. Okay, things to note about this process. How does this make the whole muscle contract? Well, that's obviously an example of one myosin head on one myosin filament. But remember, there's bundles of myosin filaments. And remember from our diagram, there's lots of myosin filaments. And you've got those stripes because you've got myosin filaments and you've got lots of actin filaments. So many cross bridges are forming and breaking very rapidly. So it kind of ratchets along. And so heads are joining, pulling, detaching, joining, pulling, detaching, joining, pulling, detaching over and over and over again very, very quickly. And that pulls the actin filament along, shortens the sarcomere, and that's happening in every sarcomere, in every myofibril, in every muscle fibre, in the whole muscle. And if that all happens together at the same time, the whole muscle contracts. And then it will relax and it will restart and go round and round and round in those cycles as long as there is an action potential arriving at the neuron. Which brings me to my next point. What happens when impulses from the motor neuron stop arriving? So when impulses from the motor neuron stop arriving, then calcium ions are actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and stored in vesicles. The tropomyosin will return to its original shape when calcium is no longer bound to it. And then the cycle will repeat again when a new action potential comes down the motor neuron. And so only when there is an action potential occurring will you have the release of calcium. And only when there's calcium will you be able to do the muscle contraction. So the cycle relies on there being the calcium there, which only happens if there is an action potential being generated at the neuromuscular junction. And lastly, how could this process stop or be interrupted? So if there's no ATP to detach the myosin head at step four, then the myosin head can get stuck or can be stuck bound here. So if we don't have any ATP, we can't progress to this step. There, there is no detachment of the myosin head. And so this is how rigor mortis occurs after death. You might have heard of bodies going incredibly stiff and rigid and they can't be moved after death occurs. 
after a certain time after death. And it's because when there's no more respiration occurring, there is not enough ATP to release those myosin heads. So all the muscles are kind of, all the myosin filaments are still attached to the actin filaments and it causes those muscles to be sort of contracted and rigid and there is no relaxation. And that's part of something that you could sort of imagine what happens if you don't have calcium ions, okay? What happens if you don't have ATP, a supply of ATP? Where in this sequence will we stop? And what effect will that have on muscle movement, et cetera? It's just one of the things to think about, but it's also an interesting way of understanding where rigor mortis comes from. Okay, so speaking of energy and ATP, uh, where do we get the ATP that we need for muscle contraction? Because each muscle fibre only contains about enough ATP to allow for about one to two seconds of contraction, which obviously isn't very long, especially if you're doing running, long distance running or anything that requires requires you to move for quite a long time. So during the exercise, the muscles must have a constant supply, which can come from a couple of different places. Obviously, the main one, aerobic respiration. So most ATP in muscles is generated via oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria of the muscle cells. And remember, these are the muscle fibers and they're in, they're sort of floating around in the sarcoid fibers or the muscle fibers. It obviously only happens with enough oxygen. So it's good for long periods of intense exercise and remember when we were talking about the fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers so specifically slow twitch muscle fibers are going to be doing a lot of aerobic respiration so that is where their atp is going to come from obviously the opposite then you've got fast twitch fibers so anaerobic respiration is going to be happening as well so atp can be made readily by glycolysis in the sarcoplasm so remember that's not happening in the mitochondria that's why those fast twitch fibers don't really have as many mitochondria. This is useful for the short periods of intense exercise, so it will get you enough ATP to give you enough of a power boost for a short period of time, but the muscles are going to tire after a while because the pyruvate is being fermented to lactate or lactic acid, which builds up, and that's going to cause your muscles to get tired and ache, and that's going to be a problem. So you're only able to do that for a short amount of time. There is another store of a chemical called phosphocreatine, and it is stored in muscle cells because it can rapidly provide phosphate, which helps to produce ATP. So ADB plus the phosphocreatine gives us ATP plus a chemical called creatine. So it basically just separates the phosphate group from the creatine in this molecule. The phosphocreatine is going to run out after a few seconds, so it's only used for short bursts of vigorous exercise if you really need it. So that's where we get that idea of only having a few seconds of contraction because we have this phosphocreatine store. It's anaerobic, it doesn't require any oxygen, it doesn't form any lactate, and creatine can be broken down into creatinine and removed from the blood by the kidneys. This is one of those ones that is going to link into our next topic um, when we're going to look at the kidneys and obviously homeostasis. But one thing that could indicate kidney damage and one thing that can be tested for to see if your kidneys are failing is if you have high levels of creatinine in the body. If it's not being removed, then that gives you an indication that maybe the kidneys might be damaged in some way. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.